oh my gosh, it's Kelsey. Kelsey's on the call. Are you here? Am I, am I delusional? I'm here. All right, so let's kick off our first, our first content session of the day uh, with the, the one and only the Kelsey Hightower. So this, uh, this, this talk or this chat is called Serializing Culture with Kelsey Hightower. So let's start by asking, Kelsey, when you say serializing culture, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so uh, we sent a video out. I think yesterday we shared a link to a much broader talk on the subject. But uh, when it comes to this whole CICD space, a lot of companies believe that there's just like this is either their path to innovation or it's this big complicated process or they're looking for best practices from other people. Right. How does Netflix deploy their software? How does Startup X deploy their software? So when I say serializing culture, every company has a way of doing things, their process, whether that's manually following a build guide. But the whole point of serializing your culture is once you understand how things work at your company, most of these tools are just that, right? They're just tools. And your goal is really to try to take all the steps or whatever process you currently have and then just try to articulate it in the tool. So serialize it, if you will, just like we do with protocols on the wire. And once they're serialized, then they can be automated through these various tools. I'm muted. What's driving your excitement around kind of shifting to that approach now? Or is that a shift? Is this something that you've always done? Like what's changed in the industry that makes us ready for this evolution? Maybe you've always been ready, but I, yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of the people have been ready. Some people have been ready for 15 years, you know? I think a lot of the platforms have a more opinionated approach. So if you're in the serverless space, there's a very clean opinionated set of APIs of how you get your app onto a serverless platform like Lambda, Cloud Run, or Heroku. All of those serverless kind of platforms are and essentially like, hey, here's exactly what you do. So it's so detailed that you don't have to do a lot of discovery work. Um, even for people coming in from like the VM world, right? All cloud providers now have really clean APIs about what it takes to spin up a virtual machine. And then, you, of course, you can use your traditional tools. And then Kubernetes is like the biggest milestone in the last five years or so, where it's opinionated about long running workloads, machine learning workloads. So now the last mile, the tail end of your pipeline, the deploy target, I think it's so much easier to deal with now than what we were doing before is why I think there's a renewed set of energy and excitement around actually finally getting this done. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, I think so on that, just thinking about how thinking about that last mile and you call it the last mile. And one of the things that comes up for me when we talk about last mile is security, because security is something that often is thought of during that last mile or thought of that's like our gate to be able to go to that last mile deployment uh, story. So we hear a lot about DevSecOps. That's a big uh, buzzword right now. To me, it means we're making security engineers fully part of the software delivery collaboration. But there's definitely tension there between DevOps and security practitioners. So I'd like to know, how do you see the DevSecOps movement impacting the software delivery process? Like, have you seen increased collaboration speed up the SDLC? Or what's your view on that, on collaboration and DevSecOps? Yeah, I am not uh, particularly uh, excited about the buzzword nonsense to me. <laughs> I figured ops, that's much. Marketing ops. It's like, you, what are you talking about? People have been involved in the process, whether they like it or not. If you write code, you're part of the security story, whether you like it or not. You pull any code you write is a liability. So you're part of the discussion or not. Now, whether you want to be explicit about it is a different ideal. So when I think about CICD, that pipeline is really for what it's designed to do. It's build artifacts, produce artifacts, and get them to where they need to go. But like the network underneath that, those things are always constant. They're not like part of this pipeline. So is security. Attackers aren't waiting for your next release. No one's like, oh, you have a new release. Let me go and you know, see what I can do now. Like It's a constant stream. So it's just a constant practice. So networking, there's a constant flow of bits. And then on the security end, there's a constant flow of what can people do, who are they, and is the software working correctly and this is true after the deployment it's going to be true after you turn the lights off and go home for the day so to me that layer there is about being intentional so what people are trying to do now is describe their security posture in a similar way like serializing it whether you're using a tool like opa opa for those familiar with the open uh, source project 
And this is where people now are starting to use these formal ways of describing their authorization policies up and down the stack. So now that we're adding policies, not just to our firewalls, not just to our networking pieces, but even to the applications. And once we have that policy, I guess, given the rise of things like the service mesh, Istio, Linkerd, Envoy, all of those tools, they all allow us to express security in terms of policy. So I think a lot of companies now are saying, hey, let's operationalize how we think about security. Let's be a little bit more intentional. And maybe we treat security like we do software. There's artifacts that are produced. We have to monitor using modern tools to see what the activity is and then respond based on the actual data. All right. So I think it's just more of a formalization, uh, but less so of like, oh, now that we have this new buzzword, more people are now doing it correctly. Like I, I don't, I don't subscribe to that. Yeah, totally agree with you. But it sounds like you think that tooling like OPA kind of helps create that glue that's needed to support DevOps and security truly working better together just as part of the process. Like kind of as it's like security is now part more part of quality, I think, in the in the paradigm that you describe. And I think that's that's exciting. It's really more of to be fair, myself included. Most people have no idea what they're doing when it comes to security at all. Most people Definitely. have no idea what they're doing to security at home. They buy a house, they got the locks that it came with. Not many people go and upgrade all their locks. They just say, oh, I need locks. This looks good. And most of those locks aren't really great at security, right? You can pick them. They're like $10 from Home Depot. So it's not like people really have any experience with security. Most people aren't security professionals. Same thing is true with the applications we write. We go get a certificate because you said I need one. I have no idea what ciphers I'm using, but I do have that certificate, so we should be all good. And I think what happens now is these frameworks and tools, they are being produced by the experts. The experts are now making them user-friendly, just like our standard libraries that allow us to do encryption, right? Don't roll your own encryption. Sometimes you can, but likely now you just have so many more tools available that are meant to be user-friendly. So I think that's where the explosion is coming from, right? Oh, I could just download these tools, put them in my workflow, and now I may have increased my security posture as a result. And I like the way you say that. I think there's a distinction there. You say, now I can take these tools and make them part of my workflow. And one of the things I've heard you talk about before is like, what's a good, like, like what is a user-friendly interface for developers? I think for you, it's it's an API that you you control on the security side, maybe you control what the API is defined as, what it looks like, and you're really strict and opinionated about those definitions. And then what's user-friendly for the developer in that in that situation is that then they can go and do whatever they want with that within the guardrails that you've set up, right? So it's almost a self-service model of collaboration. And am I hearing that right? Yeah, I think that's right because the AP no product company nails UX end to end. And when right. there's a lack of UX or there's a lack of workflow integration, right? There's no way to integrate with every workflow uh, possibility. So the thing we can fall back on is APIs. And then tools like Kubernetes or Vault, you name it, can sit on top of those APIs. I think security scanning is a good example, right? Back in the day, mm -hmm. you used to like click on the security scan button and then you get a PDF back. Yeah. And like, what do I do with this PDF? Do I just email it to a bunch of people? So I think that's an area where people are like, you know what, we need something like structured data so we can actually parse the results of the scan. And then based on those results, we can go take action inside of our live environments. So that's closing that loop between discovering issues and then remediating those problems super quick versus something that people do quarterly. Yeah. Got it. That makes sense. All right. Um, I guess we'll go on to this one. You've said on Twitter that Kubernetes is a platform for building platforms. Reg I think that was years ago, but it's like you've talked about it repeatedly as a starting point. And I want to know where have you seen folks get lost in tools or lose focus on that platform or the bigger picture? And also, like, I guess backing up for a second, like, what's the difference between a tool and a platform? Why and why does it matter? Kind of what I want to know. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. For some people, um, depending on where you're at, like if you have a great front door, meaning if for the last 10 years, your developers check in code, that code gets built and an artifact gets produced. And then behind the scenes, that artifact is then pushed out to a deploy target. You can change the backend from bare metal to virtual machines to Kubernetes and probably not even change or tell anyone that the front or the backend is different. 
because you have a clean front door. Typically, though, in ops or in operations or in infrastructure land, what we do is we make the thing, the tool, the front door. Oh, we have bare metal. Here's your SSH keys. We have virtual machines. Here's VMware. Here's AWS. Here's Google Cloud. Here's Azure. And then people start to build workflows directly on top of the raw interfaces of the tool. So when a new tool comes out, you get all the buzzwords like digital transformation, right? We're going to transform to the other tool. Uh, and with virtual machines, we saw this with like Vagrant, excellent tool. HashiCorp built an amazing tool back in the day, but that was actually kind of part of the problem. People had a bunch of VMs, you know, laptops. They're like, oh, I need 64 gigs on my laptop. I'm like, why do you need? 64 gigs of RAM on your laptop is because you're trying to run a thousand virtual machines and then the tools allow you to do that. And the thing is, that was really never the goal that we were leaking the infrastructure details up. So when I say it's a platform for building platforms, it just tries to give you this common layer at the bottom so that you can focus on whatever your front door needs to be. Some people that will look like Cloud Foundry, App Engine, you name it. Those are more suitable for the front doors. And until we get those, we're always going to need these platforms for building those platforms because one platform doesn't solve every company's in the world's challenges. So tools like Kubernetes exist. Yeah. And it sounds like it sounds like with that common layer on the bottom, with that platform layer, you have it if you because I think like there's a there's a big hype cycle around tools, right? We have that as uh, as technologists, we get excited about tools and you can capitalize that on that to get your whole company excited about using the new tool in the short term, but in the end, that doesn't actually serve, that's not about your company's story or your company's goals or you're solving your business problems. That's about getting excited about a tool. So I can see what you're saying. It's like, that's not something that you can transfer as easily. Whereas if you create a front door that tells the story that you're trying to tell, that meets the requirements that you're trying to meet, then that that's ha that has staying power, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. It may make sense, you know, if a you know if you take a group of construction workers and they all meet at Home Depot, they're gonna be like, "Oh man, look at this new saw! Look at this new hammer! Look at this new jackhammer! Oh my God, I can like build 50 houses with these!" Like, all right, that's pretty dope. And they're gonna probably talk about, "Hey, look at my new tool belt! Look at it, it's awesome, isn't it?" And it's like, "Oh man, I gotta go get that tool belt." So that kind of makes sense why we hear it so much. But the thing is, though, a lot of us are supposed to be building houses. So imagine you buy a nice little plot in the subdivision and you roll up and all the construction workers just got all their tools laid out. It's like, yo, look at all these tools, man. We're about to adopt a self-service model. You can pick any of these tools and build whatever house you want. And you're just like, uh, no, I actually think those are actually cool. Could you pick them up? Move, please. And I need my house because all I wanted you all to do was to build my house. Like, well, I think every homeowner should know how tools work because we're doing like house ops. And you should know and respect the tools. That way you'll appreciate the house that you live in. It's like, uh, negative. I got to go to work. I got a different job. I would like you to build a house so I can live in the house. That's what I want. Right. Abstraction, right? Like that's, that's kind of what we all want, I would say. Abstraction, service. Uh, I'm just not trying to be a carpenter. So I would appreciate and I will pay you gladly to let me continue with that mission. Gotcha. So it sounds like the, this is something that can help us focus on our, our company's unique strengths and values and like stay focused on those. There's, there's lots more I can say about that. I do see that we have a few questions coming in from our audience, so we can start looking at those. I do see a, a classic question, which is monoliths versus microservices. What, are, what is your choice? And I, those of us who uh, follow Kelsey on Twitter, we may know what his uh, controversial choice is but you can speak on that if you'd like, Kelsey, and I'll look for more questions. Yeah, the whole monolith versus microservices, this is the part where, again, we're taking practice and trying to turn them into best practices. If you have a monolith and you don't like it, um, you got to ask yourself why. Is there a lack of engineering culture? Is there a lack of discipline? Did things get out of whack? Is the code base just going crazy? And for some people, the next logical step is a clean refactor, take some time, pay back some of that technical debt. There's going to be extreme cases where it does make, maybe not so extreme, there's going to be cases where you want to do something new. And you look at that new thing you want to do. Let's say you want to add a mobile front end, or you want to add some integration for like the Google Assistant. You may not jam that into the existing monolith. It may make sense to just have that become a new piece, a new component that lives off to the side, its own deployable, maybe even pick a different technology stack. 
and then have that little component call back into the monolith. See, that makes a lot of sense. What people then do think is, well, let's just break up the rest of this thing that's working fine, paying our bills, been stable for 100 years, because we went to a conference and people say, you got to break up everything by default. I think that's when we start to go off the rails. So I think you're going to have monoliths for a lot of people will make sense as a place to start. Sometimes new functionality makes sense to build in isolation. If you start seeing hotspots, meaning there's too much latency in the interaction, one thing you can do from an engineering perspective is move it back into the monolith. No one's going to talk about you bad on Twitter or, or, or Facebook or anything, right? You're going to be okay, but these are just tools and architectural patterns you can try. And if they work for you, roll with them. There is no versus. Gotcha. Okay, wise, wise words. Do we have any other questions? Because I can come up with more. I want to talk, I, I guess I kind of, there's some stuff that we started talking about that we didn't talk about too much. So I'll wait for another question, but I'll, I'll also uh, bumblingly ask one in my way. So um, you talked about how, so you talked about, about experts making some of these things user-friendly and that's kind of part of understanding how things work at your company and then, company and then using your expertise to take all the steps that you need to articulate that culture in your tools. And um, you talked about OPA. Uh, you, you talked about OPA, and I guess I'm, I want to know more about how, like, what's, the, what's a really powerful way to implement that, or what's a really powerful way to implement that to do what we're talking about as far as take all the steps and articulate in the tools. And I'm probably thinking about the, I'm probably thinking about the Armory Spinnaker policy engine when I talk about that. That's, that's what my perspective is, but I want to know what yours is, Kelsey. Uh, we got to make sure we keep this stuff centered on, on, on people. And this is the biggest takeaway. I know we're towards the end here, so I'm going to wrap with this. Uh, I was watching uh, one of MLK's uh, latest talks, and uh, he talked about laws can't change the hearts of people, but laws can limit the damage that heartless people can do. And when we start thinking about all of these tools, and when we learn best practices, when we learn how to do something effectively, or when we define a policy, you can't just assume that using open policy agent or spinner could do your bills and your pipelines are going to make everyone become the very best engineer ever. But what you can do, though, is take your learning and encode them into whatever platform you're putting together for your team. And you can raise awareness through that platform. Teach people, hey, if you want to get software to production in a safe, repeatable way, We've assembled these tools. Here's what their APIs are. And maybe through learning, we've added a small thin layer on top. That's our company's platform. Once you have those things in place, those become the laws. Those become the frameworks of how things get done. And then what happens is you have this kind of happy path. So what I think of this is if you're a security professional, there's a tons of tools now, including Open Policy Agent, that will allow you to encode a lot of your expertise into a platform where you won't always be needed to make sure things are secure by default. You can go and kind of push those things out. If you're on the build infra side or if you're a developer or operations person, you can collectively can encode or serialize your expertise into your various pipelines. But remember, those things are going to be fairly brittle and they're going to be living. They're going to change as you learn or as you change things. So don't try to go and build these kind of bulletproof live forever pipelines, you got to make sure they reflect the current state of the company culture, which should always be evolving and changing based on learning. Okay, that's really good. And before I let before I let you go, Kelsey, we did have a great question uh, here that came up. And it's now gone because the live discussion has switched to the next panel, but it was from Serge at uh, SAP. And he was asking about how um, how you deal with cultural differences amongst teams and how can you how can you serialize cultural culture and how can you do cultural evolution when you have kind of a diverse cultures amongst teams. So that's something that we would really love to hear you tweet about today with hashtag Spinnaker Live so that we can continue the conversation. I know Surge is a really important uh, part of the Spinnaker community. So I want to hear your thoughts on that uh, when you have time. Thank you awesome. so much for taking the time to talk to us today, Kelsey. Awesome. Bye. Honored to have you. Bye.